Good evening and welcome to the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolutions 31st Lynch Lecture Series. I'm Alpas Sanazerdam, Dean of the, the Carter School, and it's an honor to welcome you this evening. It's so wonderful to see so many of you who came to be a part of this lecture. My faculty and I thank you for support. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize a few very important people. Let me start with the Lynch family. The faculty, staff, and friends of the Carter School are enormously grateful to the Lynch family for their friendship, generosity, dedication, and support to us over the last 30 years. Dr. Susan Hirsch, my wonderful colleague, and current Lynch Lecture Chair, whom you'll hear from uh, in just a few moments. I'd like to recognize Carter School faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and really for being uh, with me in this amazing journey. And of course, Lynn Novick, our distinguished speaker for tonight. The origin of Lynch Lecture began with the Edwin and Helen Lynch, who were among our school's earliest champions, establishing our first endowed chair in memory of Edwin's parents, Vernon and Minnie Lynch. This generous gift led to the annual Vernon and Minnie Lynch Lecture, now the Carter School's premier event that features groundbreaking approaches to analyzing conflict and promoting peace. And tonight, as we present this lecture, we are also celebrating the Carter School's 40th anniversary. This is a pivotal milestone, and we are reminded of and look back on all that we have accomplished and look forward to all that is to come. We hope that you'll join us on our new trajectory. Since the last Lynch lecture in 2019, a lot has happened at the Carter School. Well, let's face it, a lot has happened in the world. But most significant is the renaming of our school to the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter's, uh, Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution in 2020. The Carter School is a leader in peace and conflict studies, and we are proud to know that we would be able to continue making significant contribution in peace building and furthering the legacy of the Carters who have been leaders in achieving peace around the world. With our new name comes new horizons. And I hope that you will join me in continuing this important work of promoting peace and developing sustainable solutions that will have a positive impact and help to transform all communities. Right, tonight's lecture, the stories we have to tell featuring award-winning documentary filmmaker, Lynn Novi. True discussions and film clips will provide an in-depth view of the direct correlation between Lynn's work and the pursuit of peace, justice, and conflict resolution. Tonight reflects the growing interest in how peace and conflict scholarship connects with the arts, which this talk furthers. Lynn's body of work is simply amazing and eye-opening. Clips featured tonight are from such films as College Behind Bars, which tells the story of a small group of incarcerated men and women struggling to earn college degrees and turn their lives around. Baseball, which highlights the quest for racial justice, the clash of labor and management, and, and, and the transformation of popular culture just to name a few. I hope that this evening's presentation and discussions will be an enjoyable and insightful experience for you. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our Lynch Lecture Chair, Dr. Susan Hirsch. Susan Hirsch, a cultural anthropologist, is the Vernon and Minnie Lynch Chair at the Carter School. Her scholarship focuses on law in relation to conflict, international and transitional justice, feminist approaches to law and conflict and experiential learning. And Susan was, was recently nominated for a Teaching Excellence Award here at GMU. So 
Before I hand over to Susan for the next uh, stage of the proceedings, I'd like to thank you all once again for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alp. Thank you. I I'm really pleased to address this audience as the Vernon and Minnie Lynch Chair here at the Carter School. I'm very grateful uh, to the Lynch family for their generosity. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And let me do a few other thank yous before we get started. First, uh, Lynn Novak, thank you very much for agreeing to be this year's Lynch lecturer. Uh, Mercedes Alsa, thank you for being the point person for the event. Uh, Jeff Zittimer, our marketing team in, at Carter School. Uh, Priscilla Thompson and the team at Big Picture Educational, thank you. And finally, Kenneth Darby and Molly Duke at Arlington Events. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts that everyone has made to bring uh, this event uh, to be at this time today. Thanks a lot. When I was awarded the Lynch Chair, I pledged to raise the profile of justice at the Carter School. Now, our faculty have always worked on justice-related issues, and our students have always had commitments to social justice. Yet our use of the term justice and our embrace of the value, in my view, it, it, it needed to be lifted up a bit. And I'm really pleased uh, to report that among the, the changes and the things that have happened at the Carter School over the past year, we've established a peace lab, one of four new peace labs, and this one is called Transitioning Justice. The lab, the Transitioning Justice Lab, uh, is hosting now a project on restorative justice, and it's also beginning a project to provide more opportunities for incarcerated students to study peace and conflict resolution. We're, we've got gender justice and transitional justice also in our sites, so if any of these interest you, we are about to open the Transitioning Justice Lab virtually to additional students, to outside partners. Uh, let me welcome you on this occasion to uh, connect with us, take a look at the website. As part of Transitioning, Ju uh, Transitioning Justice Lab activities this year, we had tonight's speaker with us last week for a really inspiring event, Lynn Novick, uh, Daiwan Tatro and Brandon Brown uh, spoke on a panel about the extraordinary film College Behind Bars. We'll revisit some pieces from that film uh, tonight, but tonight is also about the body of Lynn Novick's work. So we'll be looking at a number of other pieces as well. Before I introduce Lynn, let me do a little housekeeping. Tonight's presentation is a conversation between myself and Lynn interspersed with film clips, again, from the body of her work. This is a webinar, so you as audience members won't be able to see one another. But please, we want you to feel free to be part of the event, primarily by asking questions using the Q&A button. Those questions, we hope some of them uh, will be answered uh, by Lynn at, at the end, uh, toward the end of the presentation. You might also get a written answer during tonight's presentation or even afterwards if uh, we run short on time. The presentation tonight is being recorded and it will be available afterwards through the Lynch Lecture page on the Carter School website. To the introduction, Lynn Novick, is an Emmy, Peabody, and Alfred I. DuPont Columbia award-winning documentary filmmaker. For 30 years, she's been directing and producing documentary films about American culture and history. Alp mentioned several of those films, Jazz, The Vietnam War, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, The War, Prohibition, College Behind Bars, and Hemingway, which is about to be released next week. Armed conflict figures significantly in Lynn's body of work. 
And that puts her work sort of firmly in our wheelhouse in the Carter School. Also relevant for us is that in all Lynn's films, uh, whether focused on baseball, jazz, prohibition, all of those films, the understories, the contradictions, the tensions of the United States as a society are, are brought up to the surface through the kind of narrative that's told. Her films expose structural violence, systemic racism and discrimination, and lapses in democracy, justice, and other American ideals. In the clips and discussions tonight, you'll hear narratives that reveal those lapses. Uh, and you'll also hear stories that highlight people's capacity for justice, peace, and redemption. Her title, The Stories We Have to Tell, resonates with our approaches here at the school, our interest in representation and growing interest in the arts, narrative, and the need to make space for people to tell their stories. Lynn Novick, welcome back to Carter School. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to the Lynch family and to everyone who's come out tonight uh, to share this conversation. I'm really honored uh, to be part of what you, the work you're doing, which sounds incredibly important, meaningful, and enduring. And you know, I hope that we can have a real exchange and conversation as the evening progresses. Um, I, I wanted to say a little bit about our work, and then we'll show some clips, and then we'll really get into it. Um, but suffice to say that I got involved in documentary filmmaking because I didn't think I had the imagination to make up stories and try to figure out how to recreate them in front of a camera but rather to tell true stories about what really happened and to use the medium of film, which is so powerful to touch people, to engage, to enlighten and to inform. Uh, it is not easy to do and it's extremely collaborative. For most of my career, I've worked closely with Ken Burns and also with Jeffrey C. Ward, who's a magnificent writer and historian and producer Sarah Botstein and many other collaborators. So even when my name is on the film that represents the work of a lot of people, and one of the things that's so important when we dig into these difficult stories is how collaboration helps us kind of get our arms around the material and figure out how to actually do this. So I do not do this alone. And I, I feel humbled even to be speaking as if I use the word I, but I really should be saying we, because it is always a we. Um, we or I have tried in all the work we do to tell stories that are complicated, that are nuanced, that are true. And in this time when we are all bombarded with false information, fake news, disinformation, and sort of an avalanche of information, and we have sometimes a hard time differentiating what really happened from whatever's out there in the incoming, it's really important to us throughout to try to ascertain the truth as much as we can. And we recognize that that's always going to be elusive but we look for facts and we check them and we double check them and we don't put anything out there until we can pretty much be sure it is the truth as close as we can find it. And that's really important to us. Another central kind of animating point is that we don't try to make an argument. We're trying to tell a story. We're not trying to prove a thesis. We're trying to explore an issue or a theme or an event from many points of view and then hope to put the information out there in a way that is narratively compelling so that our audience and our viewers can come to their own conclusions. Sometimes there are no conclusions. Sometimes history is messy and there's no easy answers. And the process of telling the story just makes things more complicated and messier. And we have to just live with that and sit with that and not try to put a bow around it and have you know, everything in a nice little neat package. And the, the third thing I wanted to say before we really dive in is that it's been an animating principle for me and the work that I've done with Ken and the work I've done with my other colleagues is that we want to present history that is honest about America's past, that celebrates our country's democratic values and principles and ideals, and equally the ways that we have never lived up to those ideals. And in the gulf between who we aspire to be as a nation and who we really are, 
therein lies the stories that I believe we need to tell. And so in thinking about all of this and sort of trying to frame everything for tonight, I have found a lot of meaning in the words of several great American writers. And I'll just quote a few today because they really helped me to kind of think about the work I do. William Faulkner famously said, the past is never dead. It's not even the past. Good history is not was, but is. And that's a, a profound comment about what is history. And we can talk about that later. Um, it's not an easy subject to answer, but history I think is the way that we today try to make sense of the past, which is not fixed. We're filtering it through our experiences today and what we think might be happening in the future. But I don't think Baldwin goes quite far enough in terms of an American story. And so I like to turn to James Baldwin, who says sort of, I think riffing on Faulkner, but really going deeper, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us, he says. We are our history. If we pretend otherwise, we literally are criminals. And this is where I think this is the animating purpose of everything I try to do. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so, you know, in a way, if I were to kind of sum up everything I've tried to do was to try to look honestly and purposefully at our past through the lens of our present and to help myself and our viewers and perhaps our country face our past, which has been very difficult and we have never really done it as I think many people here tonight understand. And I think our country is at least coming to a point of recognizing that we have not done this work and hopefully we are doing it. So with that sort of introduction, we're going to jump around a bit, but we're gonna start with a short clip from the series that Ken and I made about the history of baseball. That's the first collaboration that we had. And one of the animating uh, themes of that is this question of race in America and baseball as a lens to understand it. And we went as far as we could with the, um, it was important to us from the beginning to recognize uh, the story of black participation in baseball, exclusion from the major leagues, the creation of the Negro leagues, and then the integration of baseball after Jackie Robinson uh, came to the majors in the mid forties. And so one of the heroes of my life and a person I feel extraordinarily lucky to have gotten to know over the course of making this film is a, a man who played in the Negro Leagues and then was a coach in the major leagues. His name is Buck O'Neill. I first met him in 1990 and um, interviewed him several times for our film and then Ken interviewed him a third time. And we're gonna show a clip from baseball in which he's telling a story of uh, experience he had with the very, very famous pitcher Satchel Paige. And this is a little out of context, but you have to understand that Buck O'Neill has a nickname and Satchel Paige calls him Nancy. And I cannot explain why because it would take the rest of the evening and I wish Buck were here to tell you, but at another time, maybe we'll explain it anyway. He's gonna tell a story of an experience he had with Satchel Paige and he refers to himself as Nancy. And then the second clip is from a film he made about the second world war. And we set out to tell the story of this cataclysmic global event through the experiences and through the eyes of ordinary people, quote unquote, ordinary people. The tagline for the film was um, in extraordinary times, there are no ordinary lives. And I think that that's actually true for all times, there are no ordinary lives. But in any case, we picked four American towns, got to know people from those towns. And the selection of those towns was purposeful in that we wanted to show a range of experiences and perspectives and backgrounds. And um, I presume most people here know this already, at least I hope it's studied in school, but early uh, in the Second World War after America, after Pearl Harbor, the government decided to lock up and in turn 110,000 people, mostly American citizens. Some um, had immigrated from Japan, but these are all Japanese Americans who were put into concentration camps um, for reason of their ethnicity and no other reason. And so we, we were, it was important to us to include that incredibly shameful episode in the story of this larger story of the war. So here are our first two clips. Please play the clips. A part of Satchel that no one ever hears about is this part of Satchel. We in Atlanta, we're playing in Atlanta. The next night we're gonna play in Charleston, South Carolina. So we left that night from Atlanta going to Charleston. And when we get to Charleston that morning, the rooms weren't ready. So he said, Nancy, come go with me. 
We ride in automobiles. I said, okay. I had an idea where he was going. We went over to Drum Island. Drum Island is where they auctioned off the slaves during that period. And so he said, come go with me. And so we went to Drum Island. And they had a, a plaque there, you know, saying what had happened there. And we stood there, he and I, maybe 10 minutes, not saying a word, just thinking. And uh, after about 10 minutes, he said, you know what, Nancy? I said, what's that, you Say, seems like I've been here before. I said, me too. Because, you know, I know my great-grandfather could have been there. See, my great-grandmother could have been there auctioned off on that block. This was Satchel. This was Satchel. It was a little deeper than a lot of people thought. In Sacramento, Soon after Order 9066 was issued, hand-lettered signs went up all over town saying, Japs must go. The orders to leave arrived in May. Susumu Sato and his family could scarcely believe it. They were given one week. We were allowed to bring whatever you could carry, that's it. And so you put just essentials in your suitcase. You know, first day when we had to pack up our thing and go to the train, I really wondered what's going to happen to us. You know, that uh, this is just the beginning and uh, they may very well send us back to Japan. And that to me was uh, horrible. I, in my heart, knew my loyalty belongs to America. I went to school, pledged allegiance every morning in grammar school and so forth. And uh, for me to think that I may be sent to Japan was, uh, was uh, horrendous. We were really kind of caught in the middle when the war happened, although no question about our loyalty to our country, you know, and how we felt, this is our country. And when, this whole evacuation thing happened and it was like we had no country, you know, because we weren't from Japan and, and they took away our, our rights, actually. We couldn't protest and we went to protest it because we had to do what the government told us to do. And so uh, I think our parents realized, of course, they were, you know, not citizens, so they accepted the whole thing for us. So I think it was a lot harder, the fact that we had no rights. Uh, yeah. um, Lynn, what I especially value in that uh, first clip is the reference to something deeper, mm -hmm. that Satchel Page had something deeper inside. And it's a great reminder that the surface obscures a lot and mm -hmm. people have stories to tell, whether painful or uplifting. And, and maybe you want to say a little more yeah. on Drum Island or, or, or uh, yeah, the other I clip. I'm yeah. sorry, we had a little technical problem at the beginning, but um, Buck was just saying so that one day we were in, playing in North Carolina and Satchel said, hey, Nancy, come go with me. Let's go somewhere. And he didn't know where they were going and they went to Drum Island. And, you know, um, part of how that emerged is sort of knowing what questions to ask and building trust and being present. So that story emerged after we had spent quite a bit of time with Buck. I had especially over several years and mm -hmm. so I'm not saying he wouldn't have told that story before. I'm not sure I would have known to ask it, you know? And um, he was uh, an extraordinary person and a great storyteller, as you can tell from that one little clip. And he told us great stories about life in the Negro Leagues, about growing up and hearing Babe Ruth in spring training when he was in Florida, about working in the celery fields and wanting to get out of that, not being able to go to college because there was no opportunity for a, a black teenager in Florida. 
So, you know, through his mm -hmm. life, it went way beyond the story of baseball to a much larger and more interesting and powerful and important narrative. And I think part of it is about, you know, framing the story. Who's, what is important if you're gonna do the history of baseball, just for example, mm -hmm. and you're gonna go beyond the quote unquote heroes to see the whole country and how it plays out, what's going on in America through this pastime, so-called. Um, but that was our third interview with Buck O'Neill. And it was important to mm -hmm. him because to say that in particular, because Satchel Paige was a great showman of the game. And mm -hmm. he did a lot of um, sort of performing being Satchel Paige for the audience, getting the crowd on his side. Mm -hmm. And he had a whole theatrical way of being on the field and off. And it was important to Buck that the world would understand that there was mm -hmm. a lot more beneath the surface. And Satchel Paige played a part that he thought he needed to play in the society he lived in. So that, you know, yeah. that was a, a wonderful gift to the project and to our American narrative, I would say. Um, do, do you want to say a little more about the clip about the Japanese internment? Yes. You know, I will say for myself, uh, it's a privilege to get to do this work because so much of the history I learned in school, either in high school or in college, you know, it's hard to lift it off the page and to get a human dimension. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, when I was in high school, I went to a great high school and I had terrific history teachers, but history was not my favorite subject. I thought it was kind of boring and it was a lot of memorizing and there wasn't really a human dimension to me. So I had heard about Japanese internment. I knew it happened, but it was speaking to people who lived through it and having them share with us what it actually was like for them and their families. And they, this is a thread through the entire series. So that's not the only scene. We get to know mm. the families of Sacramento before Pearl Harbor, during this process of being told they're gonna be rounded up, leaving home, living in the camps, mm. and at the end of the war, coming home and not being welcome. So, you know, it's not exactly a happy ending of that story. And that in addition, hearing from them, uh, there was a, an, Okay, so, so America had a very segregated society and we had a segregated army. So black troops and white troops fought separately and were in, you know, even the blood supply was segregated. Mm -hmm. And there was at some point in the war, uh, pressure on the government, they founded an all Japanese unit to fight. And a lot of the young men in the internment camps volunteered or sort of felt they had to volunteer to show their loyalty to the country that had interned them. And they felt very strongly that if they didn't volunteer, and go fight, they would never be treated as quote unquote real Americans, even though they were born here and were Americans. So, and their unit suffered extraordinarily terrible losses. So we went through that whole journey with them as part of this larger narrative of the film. And, you know, it's really important to show, put a human face on what is otherwise statistics. Mm. And, that's really why we're so grateful. And also I should just say the gratitude that we feel Sarah about Stein and I and Ken Burns and our whole team to the people who share their stories, such painful stories with us. Yeah, when, when um, I think about that, this really is a key element of your filmmaking, listening to individual stories mm -hmm. that emerge through, through in-depth interviews. And, and this is something that we do a lot in the peace and conflict field as well, whether it's mm -hmm. for research, um, to understand uh, the experiences of trauma uh, uh, or of violence, uh, why people, how, be, how it felt to experience violence, how it felt to, to uh, be doing that violence. Um, also, we're interested uh, in relation to practice. When we're trying to intervene in conflict or to uh, address the aftermath of conflict. Mm -hmm. And th these, are, these are not easy things to do. And I wonder if you might just give uh, us a little more insight about how that, what that experience of listening to opening space for and holding mm. these stories that, that are really sometimes quite painful and, and difficult, what that's been like uh, for you. And um, yeah. I wonder if you share some of the same ideas that we have about uh, hearing these stories creates empathy uh, potentially in audiences, but that's not always something that you can control, right? In, in putting them out there. No, absolutely, so. you can't. There's so many parts to that very interesting set of questions. I'll, I'll try to unpack some of it and you can remind me what I didn't get to, okay. but um, 
I guess the first thing is for us, if we have the potential or the opportunity to speak to someone about something very difficult, painful, traumatic, whether they've been involved in an act of violence as a perpetrator, if that's the right word, or a someone who's experienced something done to them, either way, or they've just witnessed it, which can be extremely traumatic, you know, um, that's not a question you ask on the first date. You know, so it's a process of getting to know people and building trust, being present, just listening, even letting silence sometimes just sit there and mm -hmm. feel what, you know, let the person uh, have space for the person to just be and to share what they want to share when they're ready. And mm -hmm. I think for us, it's always important. Uh, what, what I try to avoid is something that feels extractive. Mm -hmm. You know, tell me your story. I'm taking it back to make our movie. I think that that never, that doesn't feel right at all. Mm -hmm. So how do we avoid that? So it's the person who's going to be so generous to share something I think we want them to feel and we genuinely mean that they're part of our process and that we're not taking something, but we're having an exchange. Mm -hmm. And that exchange, uh, you know, can mean explaining who we are, what we're doing, yeah. why we're there, you know, and not kind of, I'm not gonna say swooping in, but kind of showing up with a camera crew and, you know, hey, we're here to hear about the worst thing that ever happened to you. Yeah. It doesn't really work that way. So, I mean, it could work that way, but not for us. So, for example, with Asako Takuno, who you saw at the end, the woman speaking about um, how it felt to have her family to be rounded up, we spent, Sarah Botstein and I spent quite a bit of time with her months before that, camp, that interview was shot. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, we're grateful to have time to visit with her, look at her family pictures, see where she lived. Showing up is not a small part of this, but then also just telling her about our project and what we were doing mm -hmm. and why we were making this film. And, you know, the sense that we wanted to collect this history before her generation was no longer around as a time capsule for future generations to understand what they went through. So she would be representing a lot of people in her particular story and, you know, trying to be really transparent about why we are asking and what we're going to do with this material. And then the relationship continues over the course of our project. So it's not over the day we get our interview and leave. We're in you know, relatively constant communication. We need a picture. We wanted to check a fact. We're wondering if you remember this thing. You know, um, it's an ongoing relationship over the course of many years. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think there's a mutual respect there that people do feel. And sometimes if we're lucky enough, the people that we get to know become lifelong friends. Not always, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a privilege as well. So in terms of, um, what is it like for them to tell these stories? I, I feel the word catharsis is overused. Yeah. And I don't know if that's in fact the case, but I will say that sometimes we have found that people will share things with us that they don't feel comfortable sharing with the people closest to them. Mm. And I can't exactly explain that, but there's there's a, a way that a space is opened up with someone you don't know well, but that you trust and you can uh, let, let something out that feels good to get out there. And then the family will listen and be grateful that, well, you know, grandma never told us that. <laughs> yeah. So that, Th that, that's powerful. Thank you. That, that's, really, that, that's really great. And I think we'll see some of the same dynamics coming up in, in some of the clips to come. So we're gonna focus uh, next on the 10 part, 18 uh, hour film, The Vietnam War. And let, let me just start by asking you, why did you make a film about the Vietnam War? There's mm -hmm. been a lot, of, a lot of writing about it, other films, and it's such a difficult American topic. But uh, yes, and it's, difficult, it's a difficult Vietnamese topic too. Yes. And so I've been obsessed with the Vietnam War my entire life. I grew up in during the war when it was happening, but I was a child. So I knew it was happening. I knew it was a really big deal. I knew it was really terrible. I knew it was tearing the country apart, but I had no idea why. And so my you know, adolescence was filled with Hollywood versions of the Vietnam War and some seminal books. I read all the books I could get my hands on, but I still felt I couldn't quite touch it. And it is extremely complicated. So I don't think it's easy to touch. Uh, 
And after Ken and I finished our film on the Second World War, we decided that we had to do Vietnam. It was sort of World War II it felt like uh, high school and Vietnam War was graduate school. And we sort of, we, it was a huge leap uh, creatively mm -hmm. and professionally in every other way, emotionally too. Um, and I think the, 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 the motivating impulse was twofold. One, yes, a lot had been done in different ways. The Hollywood versions of the war are very powerful, not terribly accurate. And many books have been written, but very few in America represented any perspectives from the Vietnamese or, or many different perspectives of the Vietnamese. And we are, this was true when we started the project, which was in 2010. It's true now, uh, our country is so polarized and divided and so many of the divisions and sort of culture wars and red state, blue state, all these you know um, ways that we identify as different from the other side, a lot of that really took root and sort of flourished during the Vietnam War era in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to kind of understand and unpack why was that true? And perhaps to begin, if we could, a process of healing. You can't have reconciliation without the truth. And the truth of the Vietnam War, we felt had not been told. And we didn't know that we knew what it was at the beginning, but we felt we would want to try. And the most important thing for us, or one of the most, was that we weren't going to make the mistake that we felt America made, one of them, which was that it didn't matter what the Vietnamese felt or thought or who they were. And in fact, as I said, many American tellings of the Vietnam War, even some of the great ones, really do not explore Vietnamese perspectives. So to understand the war, we felt we had to go to Vietnam and we had to talk to people and do the same thing I was just saying that we did with all the other projects, but it was gonna be exponentially harder because I don't speak Vietnamese. Tried to learn, but it's really too hard a language at my advanced age, it would have taken too long to really learn to be fluent. So in any case, we went there. I mean, Sarah Botstein and I made many trips to Vietnam to meet people without a camera, just to talk to them and find out their stories and then to try to understand the war and then to do some interviews. So, um, and then by the time we finished, we also had Vietnamese American perspectives. So people on the winning side and the losing side in Vietnam. And there were many different, as many different points of view about the war there as there are here. Do you want to please set up the, oh, okay. the first clip then? So yeah, so we're gonna show a few different clips. This was an epic undertaking. The first clip is from um, pretty early in the film, our fourth episode. And you're gonna get, you'll just meet um, a man who fought uh, in the revolution in the South. And he's gonna explain sort of what was driving him. And then a woman named Mai Elliott, who we got to know and was an advisor and in interview who, um, as you'll see, has a very complicated and interesting perspective on all of this. She was living in um, Saigon at the time when the war started. Play the clip, please. Và thứ bảy thì bắt đầu là lúc đó thì không bám làm gì địa phương nó đồng ý càng rồi nó bắt đi sinh rồi bắt đầu gửi em ngủ gần đêm rồi nó bắn cái trúng như đạn một côi cái rớt ngay tim chết luôn có người anh thứ thứ sáu đó người anh rể đó bị cái là cái giác điệp nó dắt vô cho nó bẻ cổ chết nó bắn lọt đạn ngay nhà luôn nó trúng người em thì bà mẹ ở nhà thì chỉ khóc thôi động viên đứa em út phải tham gia cách mạng tiếp I was brought up to believe that the communists were people who would um, destroy the family, destroy religion, and people who had no allegiance to our country, but to international communism. My mother would describe them as no châu mặt ngựa, which means that these are people with the head of a water buffalo and the face of a horse, meaning that they, they were subhumans and uh, they were brutal. But on the other hand, I, I thought they also include people like my sister Khang and a lot of my cousins. 
I, I couldn't quite reconcile the two images. But of the two, I think the other image was much stronger because I was so scared of them. And I thought, these people must be really, really horrible people. That was the frame of mind I had when I started doing research into the communist movement. Wang Von Mai was the daughter of an official in the South Vietnamese government and was now married to an American, David Elliott. Back in 1964, she had gone to work for the Rand Corporation in Saigon. The think tank had been commissioned by Robert McNamara to do a study of enemy prisoners to find out who are the Viet Cong and what makes them tick. I remember my first interview. I was by myself. I was very young. And I was going to this pretty grim prison to interview this high-ranking cadre who had been captured. I went in thinking, I'm going to meet this beast, you know, this guy with the head of a water buffalo and the face of a horse. He walked in and he was very surprised to see me and <laughs> just as surprised as I was to see him. He was a man who had devoted all his life to fight for what he called a just cause, to free his country of foreign domination, to reunify the country under just uh, government. So he really totally believed in it to the point that he sacrificed his whole life to this cause. So I left, I was very, I was very impressed with him. When the Rand report was presented to McNamara's top deputies at the Pentagon, describing the Viet Cong as a dedicated enemy that could only be defeated at enormous cost, one senior official said, if what you say is true, we're fighting on the wrong side, the side that's going to lose this war. What really stands out to me in that one, um, well, many things, but that last bit, the Rand Corporation report, you know, knowing mm -hmm. that the war was unwinnable and still mm -hmm. the US government went forward. And I think these are some of the stories that the, mm -hmm. the film overall begins to pull mm -hmm. out about things that were not often known uh, at the moment. Uh, what stood out to you in doing all of these interviews uh, with people in Vietnam? Um, you had been thinking so much about Vietnam. Yeah. What, what really did those interviews well, uh, do for you? The very first thing, and this should have been obvious, and I am horrified and embarrassed to say that it really wasn't. Um, my first trip to Vietnam, I, you know, we had a list of people to meet. And so and we have a wonderful Vietnamese producer, Ho Dang Hoa, who helped us to meet with veterans and politicians and a whole range of people. And um, I would ask, and, and, and then I would also, you know, it might someone in a hotel, just anyone I would meet that they spoke English, I would ask. So we're here to make a film about the Vietnam War. Just, you know, what do you remember about that time? And every single person I asked that question of knew someone who died in the war, usually a friend or family member. Now, this is a country of 30 million people at that time during the time of the war, and they lost two to three million people, 10% of the population. The equivalent here would be 30 million Americans killed. Right, so it's unimaginable the scale of loss or during, during the time of the Vietnam War, we didn't have as large a population as we have, you can do the math, but it's in the tens of millions it would be. We have 58,000 names on the wall and that's what we Americans have focused on. And each name mm. is a tragedy, a complete tragedy for that family and for our country. And I'm not trying to negate or minimize that, but going to, and I don't think, you know, without having gone to Vietnam, if I had heard those numbers maybe I'd have some kind of abstract relationship to that mm -hmm. idea. But when every single person you meet knows mm -hmm. someone personally, you know, it, it gave, it, I began to dread asking that question. I began to think, I don't really want to ask because I know I'm going to hear something really devastating. And often it was more than one person. So it was just physically being there and just talking to people casually or seriously and beginning to understand mm -hmm. how epic and, um, unspeakable the losses they suffered. Yeah. Now, one of the ways I've had access to that sort of psychically or emotionally or, you know, on a human level was through a novel. 
which speaks to the question we're raising about how to tell what story should be told. Um, a Vietnamese veteran named Bao Nin wrote a novel called The Sorrow of War that was published at a time when there was relative openness in the society in the early 90s. And it's been, it's been compared to All Quiet on the Western Front, um, which is a mm. devastating novel of, from a German perspective of World War I and just the psychic toll of you know, unspeakable loss. So I say all that to say that I had to go to Vietnam personally and meet people who lived through this to begin to understand even a little bit what they went through. Mm -hmm. That then raised all kinds yeah. of questions. Why didn't America understand this? Why don't we care about what happens when we go to war far away. And the other piece of it for me, which I, I, I feel is very provincial to say this, but physically getting on an airplane and traveling for an entire day and going to a country on the other side of the world, and then thinking, we fought a war over here. Mm -hmm. We sent soldiers, materiel, tanks, napalm, airplanes, you know, ice cream, beer, I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. you know, we built swimming pools and bowling alleys, you know, everything that Americans would need or want. But the, the, the practicalities and the realities of what it took to do that. And then that raised the question, why? Mm -hmm. What was at stake for America? What were we yeah. fighting for? Which was of course a central question that could never really fully be answered. There are so many of, of these larger themes that are being teased out through, mm -hmm. uh, through the film. And then there are the on the ground, very gritty, uh, experiences that mm -hmm. people have that are also represented mm -hmm. in the film that are quite difficult at times mm -hmm. uh, to watch. And I think those begin to hit, th again, themes that are of great interest uh, to us in the conflict field about humans' capacity for violence uh, and how, um, how people can become so violent toward one another. And mm -hmm. it's difficult to watch, but I think the next clips, if you wouldn't mind setting those yeah. up, take us into that territory. Mm -hmm. And they do, let me just say uh, to the audience, they contain some offensive language and some uh, depiction that's quite sobering uh, uh, of how people can uh, behave with respect mm -hmm. to violence. So just be warned, but Lynn, give us some context yeah. if you don't mind for these next two. Yeah. you know. Um, the historian and writer Paul Fussell, who fought in the Second World War, he wrote a book in which he talked about the real war. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, the pretend war, but the real war is in the front lines where the killing and the dying take place. Mm -hmm. And those of us who haven't been there really can't understand what it's like and don't really want to know, or you know, we don't. We we think we want to know, but we really don't. And we were very. It felt like you can't make a film or tell a story about a war without trying to get there and tell that story too, to honor mm -hmm. the sacrifice, the service, the trauma that the people who did find themselves on the front lines of the real war, what did they go through on all sides? And so that's what we tried to do with these short clips where you'll see Vietnamese and American talking about just their experiences and you know what happens to the human soul in this context. I think you can play those that real, please. My hatred for them was pure. Pure. I hated them so much. And I was so scared of them. I was terrified of them. And the scareder I got, the more I hated them. Anh chấp sửa cái thương và cái tình cảm và cái 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 lòng căm thù nó cũng có sẽ đan xen ở tranh chấp nhưng mà cái lòng căm thù khi đã đánh nhau thì cái lòng căm thù phải diệt bởi phương là chính. Cũng là việc quyết tâm diệt chúng tôi, mà chúng tôi cũng việc quyết tâm mà diệt được cái nhiều dịch mình. I only killed one human being in Vietnam, and that was the first man that I ever killed. I was sick with guilt about killing that guy and thinking I'm going to have to do this for the next 13 months. I'm going to go crazy. And I saw a Marine step on a bouncing Betty mine. And that's when I made my deal with the devil in that I said, I will never kill another human being as long as I'm in Vietnam. However, 
I will waste as many gooks as I can find. I'll wax as many dinks as I can find. I'll smoke as many zips as I can find, but I ain't gonna kill anybody. You know, turn a subject into an object. It's racism 101. It turns out to be a very necessary tool when you have children fighting your wars for them to stay sane doing their work. We had started walking up and we'd probably gotten about a third of the way up the hill and then they un unleashed on us. We were in the middle of this horrible shit sandwich. That's what we called it. One of the things that I learned in the war is that we're not the top species on the planet because we're nice. talk a lot about how well the military turns you know kids into you know killing machines and stuff and i'll always argue that it's just finishing school cái người lính đầu tiên mà ra trận mà bắn chết kẻ địch đầu tiên thì lúc đó nó kinh sợ lắm lúc đó nó kinh sợ lắm làm cái hành động giết người rất kinh sợ nhưng mà sau đó nó quen chứ sao chiến tranh nó, nó làm nó 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 thức dậy cái thú tính của con người Tôi thì tôi ở trên rừng cũng rất nhiều Con vật nó không thế đâu Con hổ trong rừng nó cũng không thế đâu Con hổ chỉ bắt mồi khi nó cần ăn Nhưng con người là giết nhau không phải Không vì cái nhu cầu sinh sống của bản thân mình Mà giết rồi còn băm nát Cái xác nó lên không ạ cái sự cái cái giả man của chiến tranh ghê gớm That's a tough lesson about human nature. It is indeed. You know, I think we members of society that have been lucky enough not to have to go to war should at least try to understand what it's like for the people who do that for us on our behalf. And when we, I mean, this, it kind of goes without saying, but I think it still needs to be said, you know, there's a, a human and psychic toll and some, you can go across into a place where it's hard to come back. And yeah. as a society too. So, you know, um, I, I am especially grateful to John Musgrave, who you saw in the first clips, using all the epithets and offensive language, you know, very consciously to describe his way of thinking at that time and what it took to dehumanize the enemy, who were young men just like him, but he couldn't think about them that way because then he couldn't do his job. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's a very painful and difficult reality and, um, It's courageous of him to tell it. And I, I, I think I do, you know, it, that interview was one of the most devastating um, in all my years of doing this. And because he was so honest. Yeah. It, it just, the two clips together just really demonstrate the multiple forms of trauma that mm -hmm. uh, can be experienced and that are you know, go down for years for the people who are mm -hmm. holding them and then at times are passed, right, to mm -hmm. other generations. Um, it, it's uh, it's um, mm. really an, an amazing feat to, de to depict those, uh, I think. Um, well, one, one thing that came up, came about after the film was done was that John Musgrave was finally able to go back to Vietnam. Mm. Um, as a result of the film and meet with Vietnamese veterans and kind of find some, 
I hate to say closure. There's no closure. No closure. There's no closure. That's a terrible word, but to work his way through those feelings that he described, which were still pretty real to him when we did that interview. Um, he actually has a book coming out and he's gonna talk about what that process was like and you know, to kind of face his demons, to honor the friends who he lost and the guilt he feels for having survived and all of that and also to have met his former enemies mm. and been in the places where, you know, and to realize they're all grandfathers now. Uh. I mean, those kinds of reweaving uh, or, mm. or uh, starting new forms of relationship after significant violence are, are of great interest to, to us in the peace and conflict field. And, and another mm. area that uh, we have a lot of interest in is uh, the human capacity for peace <laughs> and uh, the, the striving that people do in time of war to try to make peace uh, mm. or to resist violence. And so uh, the the Vietnam War contains a lot of information and, and footage about war resistors and nonviolent protests. So we'll see a couple of clips from that. Do you want to say anything about those? Yeah, I, I think show them? Yes, I, I think I'll just add a little bit, which was that, you know, the categories of patriotic and unpatriotic became very um, challenged during the Vietnam War era when you had a government policy, uh, which many people came to feel was immoral and wrong and not to mention unwinnable. And so over time, you know, people began to really say, I'm not going to go and participate in this. Mm -hmm. And that is the patriotic thing to do. And even saying it's <clears throat> one of the veterans we talked to said he felt he did the, um, cowardly thing by going to Vietnam and the courageous thing would have been to resist the war. Mm -hmm. So it's just it, the, 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 a conflict like this upended any sense of right and wrong, good and bad, what it means to be a patriot. And so, and the protests and the reactions to it and the feelings turned up, it got very complicated. So we are gonna show, this is a, a central theme in the film, but it, it took all kinds of paths and some of the great heroes of this time are the people who stood up and said no. And eventually the war came to an end, at least as far as America's participation. So we're gonna show a couple of clips that just throw some of this into relief and then we can see where that Thanks. Goes. Please play those clips, thanks. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I never considered the Vietnamese our enemy. They had never done anything to threaten the security of the United States. They were off 10,000 miles away, minding their own business. And we went there to their country, told them what kind of government we wanted them to have. Well, when I, I see the war protesters, I react on a couple of levels, intellectually, I certainly understand their right to the freedom of speech, but I will tell you that when I see them waving NLF flags, the, the enemy that I and my friends had to fight and some of my friends had to die fighting, that doesn't sit very well with me. On November 15th, 1969, half a million citizens turned out against the war in Washington again. This time, buses provided an impenetrable wall around the White House. President Nixon claimed he was too busy watching football on television to pay attention. But he did suggest that army helicopters might be used to blow out the marchers' candles. Hundreds of thousands of others demonstrated in San Francisco and New York. late 60s were a kind of confluence of several rivulets. There was the 
anti-war movement itself. The whole movement towards racial equality, the environment, the role of women, and the anthems for that counterculture were provided by the most brilliant rock and roll music that you can imagine. I don't know how we could exist today as a country without that experience. With all of its warts and ups and downs, that produced the America we have today and we are better for it. And I felt that way in Vietnam. I turned the volume up on all that stuff. That represented what I was trying to defend. That's quite a statement that we're we're better for it for the whole package that you know we sort of but it is what it is as you were saying before what makes the US what it is today including including our divisions and I, I'm wondering what you're thinking about having made the film and listened to a number of audiences what are you thinking about those divisions today you know is it that we haven't healed from the the divisions of Vietnam. Well, I think we still have a lot of work to do and one documentary film can't do it all. Um, but I will say it was hard and you know, this recent events are, it's hard to feel optimistic in the face of what we've just been through. But I will go back a couple of years to our film came out in 2017 when the country was divided as divided as now. And these same divisions were kind of fairly ossified and there were a series of screenings and we found out about one after the fact, a library in New Jersey invited veterans and pro war protesters to come and watch mm -hmm. the film in person. Um, and they came, I think, you know, over a series of days, maybe watched the whole film as it was broadcast or at least over a short amount of time. And uh, there was an article in the local paper in which after they had finished the entire film, um, a man who had been against the war came up to a veteran and said, you know, I protested the war, I thought it was wrong, but I never really realized what you soldiers went through and I want to say thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that story before and it's really powerful, but this is the part that was new to me. The veteran said, hey, you know, I didn't fully understand it at the time, but I appreciate now that you were right to protest the war mm -hmm. and thank you for your protest. <laughs> And these are people who wouldn't have been able to speak to each other before they watched this film. So I think a, a story like this told the way we told it or the way it can be told where you have space to hear from people you don't agree with and not be too quick to judge and then to bring in the Vietnamese perspectives and to also in this case, have a better understanding of the political decision-making which goes back to your point about the Rand report. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, I think we were able to change the conversation and people could find space to see through the barriers that we put up between ourselves. Yeah, the, the, there's a lot to say about the protest footage, and you know, you just think about what what um, the experiences around the Black Lives Matter movement, the Women's March, what happens on the streets of Washington D.C how presidents respond, right? Um, you know, some of these things end up feeling very, very uh, similar and cyclical. And again, I think we could say a lot about it. If, if you don't mind, maybe we'll move to, uh, from Vietnam to uh, a couple other projects, just I have, uh, as I'm watching the time. Uh, yeah. so, so most of your films have taken up uh, subjects uh, that are sort of decades uh, in the past, and they're, they're really histories, but not College Behind Bars. That one engages a very current issue of mass incarceration and the lack of rehabilitation and education in, in U.S. prisons and the violence of U.S. prisons. And 
Um, it's also your film as a solo director. So can you just say a little bit about uh, why you chose this uh, oh. project and what it means for you and, and maybe set up the, uh, the next uh, clips. We'll see some pieces from College Behind Bars. Yeah, this was a, I feel very grateful to have had the opportunity to tell this story. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Botstein, the producer that I've worked with for many years and Salima El Amin, another producer and Mariah Duran, another colleague, we made the film together and we had the chance to follow and get to know a group of people who were incarcerated who were going to college and to see through their experiences the transformative power of education, which I personally have experienced myself as having been privileged to have a great education and taken that for granted to some degree and to sort of be able to see close up through their experiences what can happen when people who have been written off and marginalized and not given the opportunities that they should have systemically and over generations walk into college classrooms like your students have mm -hmm. and find out how smart they are, which mm -hmm. is what they say. You know, They didn't realize they could do great academic work and had something to contribute. And um, it was a project that came about because we had a chance to give a lecture in one of the classrooms in the program called the Bard Prison Initiative. And over, it took many, many years to do. And it, it felt that it was a story that really hadn't been told. There have been lots of documentaries about prison and about mass incarceration, about criminal justice. This was a story within that context about equity, access, and hope. Mm -hmm. And we're so grateful to the people who share their stories with us over many, many years. We've never made a film like this. There's no narrator. Um, it's their story through their voices. And we collected 400 hours and had to boil it down to four one-hour episodes with our editor, Trisha Reedy. And our, it, it was a very daunting project a very different kind of way to tell a story, but um, ultimately one of the most rewarding things I've ever been able to sink my teeth into. Mm -hmm. So I think we, you know, I know we're, we're short on time, so we'll just jump in um, and uh, show a couple of clips and then we'll see where, what we have time to discuss. But we, we picked two short clips. One is just um, that men and women are in different facilities. So we followed a group of women and a group of men. And you'll see the women early in their college experience um, wrestling with some very difficult material. And then the second clip is really toward the end of the series. Um, the students who are in the bachelor's degree program are required to create, to produce rather a 100 page senior project. It's a year long independent research uh, effort. Mm -hmm. And they do the research with help from um, outside from, you know, they have to request library materials and have them sent. So it's a little bit cumbersome, but they, they, they can do research from inside prison without access to the internet. And one of the students you'll see him, once you've done your senior project, you have to present it to the faculty. So we, we, we filmed a little bit of his presentation. Please roll the clips. To face the reality of our condition. The class that I'm teaching now is the first year seminar. It's a mix of literature, philosophy, politi political science, history. It's a lot of different things. Bureaucracy doesn't go along with democracy because it doesn't give the right representation for the people. They think that socialism should be the way the way society goes through through bureaucracy because um, it's through the economy. You're on the right track, but I want to see does somebody else get that same thing from it? They wanted to use socialism towards um, democracy uh -huh. so that they could think that was their own choice, like so they could think it was autonomous. This is why industrialization and bureaucracy is good for social harmony. So by them explaining it, people would think like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That class is probably like the most challenging. But um, I don't know, what you think? I hate it. I don't know. I got an A minus slash B plus. No, so. I don't think I should use hate. Okay, I just really don't like it. This semester is definitely harder than last semester. There's a lot more material and you have to go like deeper and it's a lot more of like um, your own thoughts. I was still surprised because like I couldn't believe that I was capable of doing that. Like the work that it was giving mm -hmm. us was hard. And I'm like, I did that really? It just causes you to think. It causes you to look at the United States differently. It causes you to look at politics differently. It just, cool. it just alters your mind altogether. It changes your whole outlook on the world, period. You know, knowing that this is not the end for you. Mm -hmm. 
The thesis for the project is that Americans in general have used the black body as an object of rhetoric to define their identities. Black people, for example, used the suffering black body. There's a lot of really powerful language, the idea of messianic. Benjamin says that we shouldn't look at history as linear. When he says messianic, he's saying that this past is constantly being resurrected. So this is the absolute word. During the course of my research, I developed a hyper-awareness of the many often insidious ways in which society disfigures the personhood of marginalized people. I noticed the attempt of so many to lump disparate elements into the category of blackness or some other category meant to house the unworthy, categories such as offender or inmate. It is difficult to live, to function in one of these categories. It begins to feel like scarf that one cannot scrub clean from the body. I am a quote, irredeemable, trapped in one of these crippling categories for the undeserving. I'm reluctant to use the word anger. In America, anger and blackness and offender is considered a volatile mixture. But everyone, every single one of us should seethe when injustice is rampant and bodies are falling, and the nation is divided about whether or not the losses of Eric Garner, of Laquan McDonald, of Mike Brown, of Trayvon Martin, insert here, are worth mourning. Mourning is not a question of race and bodies. It is a question of humanity. Let me say it plainly. The black body is a prison of flesh, and the truth is unforgiving. African Americans can no more relinquish their signifying black bodies than they can change the history of this nation, but they must continue to demand. I, I just have to say, I'm going to jump in with the trial going on this week. I find that more devastating than it usually is for me. Um, and to think about Rodney writing that I think that's four years ago. The insert here, you know, there are a yeah. lot more names to fill in to insert here. Um, so anyway, and but I think also what he says about Benjamin saying that history is not linear, it's messianic. Uh, okay, I learned something on every project that was so revelatory. I just, yeah, so grateful. It's it's really an amazing um, an amazing piece. We saw it last week when when you came in. It feels awkward in this moment to just see such a small amount of that extraordinary film and and those um, incredible um, students uh, in in the film. And so I want to take this moment to say that uh, George Mason Library has access to all of the films that we've seen tonight and others. So let me encourage everyone. Uh, and I know that uh, College Behind Bars is available in other venues as well. Um, Netflix, I think, and uh, PBS. PBS. PBS, sorry. Yeah. Both, um, yeah. So great. So I, I mm, um, I, uh, let, let me just ask you a quick question about it, Lynn, which is, you know, there are no quick questions, but this okay. one, you've been promoting it a lot in terms, like you, as you did for us last week of going to different campuses and, mm -hmm. and talking about the uh, issues. So the U.S. is just known for being a very punitive society. And mm -hmm. are you finding that people are ready to hear a different story, one about, um, people having opportunities and possibilities uh, after uh, perhaps being convicted of a crime? Yes, I, the short answer is yes. And I don't think it's just our film. I, I think, you know, we are, the narrative is changing. It needs to change a lot faster and a lot more holistically and system, systemically yeah. for us to have the real change that we need. And it's way long overdue. Yeah. Um, I think Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy is extraordinarily important. Yeah. Um, and our film is a different kind of story, but it is, you know, showing viewers, human beings who are fully dimensional, who have their own story to tell, complicated stories to tell. And one of the things that was important in the film was that all the people that we got to know 
are incarcerated for serious crimes. And over time, over the course of the film, you, you, you find out why, not at the beginning, but late in the story when you get to know people really well. And so this is not a story of exoneration and false conviction. Those stories are extraordinarily important and need to be told, but we also have to reckon with what happens when people have done harm and how do we get to some kind of better place for them and for us and for the community and education and opportunity often denied before people get into that situation in the first place are really at the core and need to be the, cent the conversation I believe and people who we've gotten to know believe need to be needs to be centered around education. And so I, you know, we, we see the conversation shifting and you know we've been to many screenings and we've had many comments from people I never knew I didn't think about it. I didn't realize, yeah. you know, we need more of these programs. We need fewer people in prison. We need better access to education. All those questions um, seem to be, you know, engaged in a deeper way after seeing a film like this. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that this conversation will ripen and move forward in our Carter School community. Um, so I, I think that it's, uh, Going to be thought provoking. This this will be a thought provoking moment uh, for us that hope that I hope uh, pushes us toward action. So we uh, have just a few moments, okay. uh, uh, and uh, would you like to show the the clip from Hemingway, and then we'll take a couple. Sure. Questions. Yeah. This is just a, a sneak peek. Basically, Hemingway starts airing on Monday, so we just thought you know Hemingway is a iconic American writer who does wrestle with war and conflict in many of his works and some of the things we've been talking about. So we, we picked a short clip to show just a little bit of a little taste of what we uh, what we discovered in our story of our stepping way. Play the clip, please. In the novel, Lieutenant Henry deserts and flees to neutral Switzerland with Catherine Barclay. They hope to marry and build a life together once the war is over. She is pregnant. But something goes terribly wrong in the delivery room. Doctors perform a cesarean. The baby is stillborn. Catherine's life ebbs away. Hemingway agonized over the ending, writing 47 versions of the final pages before he was satisfied. I went to the door of the room. You can't come in now, one of the nurses said. Yes, I can, I said. You can't come in yet. You get out, I said, the other one too. But after I had got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. It was like saying goodbye to a statue. After a while, I went out, left the hospital, and walked back to the hotel in the rain. Parts of a farewell to arms could have been written by a woman. Now, I regard that as a compliment. Hemingway might regard it as an insult, but I don't, because it is the androgyny in a man or a woman that allows them, even if briefly, not utterly, to be able to put themselves inside the skin of the opposite thing. In many ways, I think it's his greatest novel. I do. It's the truest. It's also heartbreaking. I remember crying and crying and crying. He gets the all the the boy stuff, the man stuff, he gets the horror of the war. But when people put that book down, what do they remember? They remember a woman dying in childbirth. 
If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them to break them. So of course, it kills them. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too. But there will be no special hurry. Susan, you're still muted. Yeah. The, the comments about about seeing across um, the difference of of gender. This this comment resonates, and being able to make make art androgynously mm -hmm. or somehow with both um, mm -hmm. both elements in mind, it resonates with one of the questions from the audience. So I want to put those right. together and okay. move us to Q&A. So the, this question asks about uh, how we think at the Carter School a lot about telling stories across lines of difference. What does it mean to, um, as a person who's positioned perhaps racially or culturally or by gender, telling a story about, about someone else? How do you think about that? and how do you think about your own potentially your own perspective or positioning influencing how the narrative might end up being presented? How do you negotiate? Yeah, that? that's a lot. Yeah. And first thing is to, I mean, right. So I think the first thing is to recognize and own who you are, and not you know I hate I don't hate I shouldn't say hate I don't think it's appropriate to say I know how you feel, or. This must be however, whatever it is that you presume to understand where the other person is coming from or what their truth is. And so to just, I think, have a lot of humility and recognize the limitations of your own uh, perspective, background, ethnicity, privilege, all these things are shaping each of us. And so, you know, um, claiming a solidarity that may not really be there yeah. is very problematic and I think insulting potentially to someone. So, you know, and I think having an inclusive team of colleagues and collaborators so that, you know, you're not relying on your own biases, whatever they may be, or bias. I mean, we all have our bias, we all have our subjective perspectives on the world. So we, none of us can be purely objective. So I think being aware, being purposeful, being humble, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, owning sort of who you are. I, that's all I that's all I really know how to do yeah. and that's that I think that's a start I think that's a great that's a great answer and and one that I think helps us uh, in our field and students who are trying to mm -hmm. think about telling stories um, themselves uh, let me ask another question from an audience member um, are you it's from one of my colleagues okay. uh, are you ever concerned that there are topics you're too close to that you couldn't mm. do justice to that is such a good question. Probably. It, it is good to have a little distance, although I love watching and, you know, films that are very personal to people. So I don't know that you can't tell a story if you're close to it. And I'm thinking in particular, my, my partner, Kenneth Rosenberg is a psychiatrist and a filmmaker, and he made a film called Bedlam about serious mental illness in America. Mm. And he decided to put himself into the film and tell his story because his sister suffered from schizophrenia and that shapes his whole life and whole reason for wanting to make the film. So instead of just having that be something that you knew if you knew him, he actually put himself in the story. Mm -hmm. And that can be, first of all, very honest, and second of all, very effective as an mm -hmm. audience member. So I, I'm not against that approach. Um, so I don't think there's, if you're close to a story, I think you just probably, again, it's almost in that owning category mm -hmm. of you know explaining who's telling the story and why are you telling the story? And um, you know being straight with the audience about that. I think that's what, you know, that's how you can do that with integrity. I think this might be our last question. Okay. So, and it's a good one. How do you think about balancing or counterbalancing the heaviness of the topics and tragedies you mm. explored? Well, I do think humor is incredibly important. Mm. And, you know, especially when we were, 
well, even Buck O'Neill talking about, you know, enduring racism in America, he also has a great sense of humor and, you know, yeah. not to make light of anything, but you sort of get a sense of that helping people get through things sometimes. And I found that a lot in talking to soldiers, veterans, there's a kind of a weird, not weird, there's a black humor and irony that is very powerful and disarming and sometimes off-putting, but very real. So I think for, for a lot of people, humor is essential, um, but not to say that you don't take the work seriously, we do. So, I, you know, that's one small thing, but the other thing is just, I think to give yourself as the filmmaker or the viewer, you know, room to feel what you feel. So mm -hmm. after I, I remember after, actually after speaking with Rodney, who you saw defending his brilliant thesis, when he, the shoot we did with him where he described the reason why he's incarcerated. I mean, I had to come home and lie down for at least a day. So, you know, there's, if you're doing your job well, it works on you in ways that are very intense, but I'm not in the least bit, I would, it just, you have to recognize that. Yeah. No, so. I'm, I'm really appreciative that you're mentioning that because again, when we're working in a, a field around conflict and, and, and violence, uh, the idea of self-care is really important. And I think we're talking about it more uh, mm -hmm. for ourselves, for people on teams that we are working with in doing interviews, um, as well as being incredibly sensitive to the trauma that might be created by someone yeah. retelling a, a story and, and again, trying to balance yeah. that. Yeah. I, mean, I, think you, I think you have to hope, and I do, that for the person telling it, that it is a positive, ultimately a positive experience for them or they, they wouldn't, you wouldn't want to ask them to yeah. do it. And yeah. in the Vietnam project, um, Sarah and I spent a lot of time with the Crocker family and Jean Marie Crocker lost her son in Vietnam. And for her to sit down and tell that story, not just celebrating him and remembering him and helping us bring him alive, but also describing the day that she found out that he had been killed and the funeral and her survival afterwards and what the family was really shattered and just utterly devastating and there's no nothing good about it zero and you know getting to know them and hearing the story sarah interviewed the daughter and i interviewed the mother it was you know we you can't help but think i hope this isn't re-traumatizing them mm -hmm. to go through this again but after the film came out i heard from both of them that actually that process of participating in the film opened up conversations about something that had been so painful they had not been able to talk about it in their own family. Mm -hmm. And so, and they also felt they were helping other people who'd been through that. And so going, their pain perhaps could help, if it helped other people, it felt like better to them. So I hold on to that. And I think that does, that does happen. I, I myself have had that experience and I, I know a number of colleagues and students of, of drawing on what might be a really difficult experience with a broader project in mind of educating about uh, how to move forward. So I'm going to sneak in one last one before we thank you, okay. Lynn, and it's one I hoped would come. What would you tell a young film student, uh, someone who wants to get into this kind of work? And I know we've got students who are interested in making film about uh, peace building, about conflict resolution, and about conflict itself. Um, I would say find a way to get yourself in the room where it happens, so to speak, which is, you know, just being present and, and being able to participate as an intern or apprenticing yourself to people who are doing the work. You can learn a lot by just being there and listening mm -hmm. and participating a little bit and helping, even if it's running to get the coffee or, you know, find some, uh, do some research, just, you know, watching the process from people who know how to make these films can learn an enormous amount. And that's how I got started. I'm very grateful <laughs> to the people who let me in the room when the time, you know, when I had the chance. Well, thank you so much for coming uh, to be with us at Carter School. Thank you for bringing the clips. As I mentioned, the recording will be available. It's, it's just been wonderful to get to know you and uh, your work will uh, be used in classrooms, I have no doubt, and has been inspiring for me and uh, I suspect for others uh, on this uh, webinar as well. So thank you so much, Lynn, well, for coming. Thank you, Susan. It was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity. I wish we could have been in person. I would love to have seen all your students and 
get a chance to talk to some of you individually. So, you know, definitely keep in touch with us and um, really thank you for the chance to sort of take a moment and explore some of the themes that have been underlying what we've tried to do. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for your work. And everyone, um, thank you for coming. Uh, please uh, check out uh, other things that are going on on the Carter School uh, website. And if you have interest in uh, these issues around, um, around uh, justice that I've been mentioning or, or expanding educational opportunities for incarcerated students, please you can get in touch directly uh, with me. So uh, take care. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Good night. Thank you.